there's a little known part of Hollywood that most people are not aware of, known as the audience test preview. The recently released book, Audienceology, reveals this for the first time. Our podcast series, Don't Kill the Messenger, brings this book to life, taking a peek behind the curtain. And now, join author and entertainment research expert, Kevin Getz. My guest today has been quoted as saying, movies are made in post-production. I can't say I disagree with that. She then goes on to explain that is truly where the three principal elements, the picture, the sound, and the music converge. And I thought it would be really interesting to talk about the post-production part of the business. For those of you who have read my book, Audienceology, you know that we talk a lot about the process of screening a movie for an audience before it's released. And that happens in the post-production period. Nancy Kerhofer is my guest, and she is so accomplished. I don't think she ever has fewer than eight to ten movies on her docket at any given time. Movies like Being the Ricardos, The Trial of the Chicago Seven, Book Smart, Molly's Game, Scream, the most recent Scream, which is not out yet. And then I Feel Pretty, Ouija, and Neighbors, too. To name a few, and that would be a normal group of movies that she'd work on at any given time. I don't know how she does it, but she does it. When I see her, I light up. She's such a pro. And I just want to say that it is a pleasure to bring a different perspective to the program by inviting Nancy Kerhofer here today. Nancy, welcome. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. I just love seeing your face. It makes me happy. Oh, Nancy. Well, Nancy and I have known each other. How long has it been? My oh, Lord. Oh, my God. My very first preview was you. I mean, I think my very first preview was like, I know you last summer with oh, Neil Moritz. Oh, my Lord. And that was my very first movie. Did you hear the podcast with Neil as my guest? I heard... Part of it. I didn't finish it. Oh, but yeah. I will. I promise. Yeah, yes. no, it's, it's, he's wonderful and it's really good. And uh, it's funny, my husband did the ad campaign. So I was very yeah. connected to that movie. Funny. But uh, that was the first time we met. Yeah. Wow, that's a lot of years ago. Yeah. That's a lot of years ago. And I want to ask you something right off the bat because a lot of our listeners aren't aware of really what a post production person does. Right. Okay. And you also are credited as both a post-production producer and a post-production supervisor. Can you also share what the difference is between those two? You know, the job has evolved a lot in the last couple of years. I mean, I started as a post-supervisor. We all did. We're all post-supervisors by nature. And it used to be where I'd get hired and there would be a producer on board and a studio exec and there's a chain of command. And I would come on. I was a supervisor. So I would always answer to somebody else, like a producer most likely or a head of Uh post-production at a studio. But lately, the change in the dynamic of the industry is, A, post-production starts way sooner. I'm usually, as a post-producer, come on in prep to help get the show up and running. And a lot of times there aren't the same structure of people. Like no one is actually producing in post-production. There isn't oftentimes a producer who is boots on the ground, Day to day in the cutting but that's room. But that's a line producer, or that's yeah, a. Or, and but, that's, but that's a post producer. The idea of a, the operative word being where post. It's come. We come into prep. What are you going to do during prep? Well, what happens now is because it's just such a colossal amount of work that happens in visual effects and in setting up editorial these things. Ah. Where it used to be, the line producer would do it, or a head of post production. They're too busy with so many other tasks, and also don't forget. Like, it used to be a, an average studio exec would be overseeing a handful of projects. Now they have tons of them because so much content is being shot. Like, more movies are being made now than ever in the history of How filmmaking. do you accept a movie? Well, I get an offer usually from somebody I know. Like, I don't have an agent or anything else. Word of mouth. Word of mouth. And someone will call me and, like, someone I worked with in the past who I've had a good experience with. And they say, hey, look, I got this movie. Would you be interested? Are you available? I'm like, well, let me see the script. It's not just because I'm your friend, but you absolutely have a stellar reputation. And people always like working with you. And they also return. A lot of people. And I thank you for saying that. Apparently, someone told me once, I've done like 140 or 150 movies in my career. I was shocked when they said that. And I'm like, that's impossible. Uh But then I guess it is possible. But of all those movies, 
I would say there's a handful that I failed at, like five or six that I just define failure. You know, like I didn't get on with the filmmaker. I didn't do my best work. I, you know, just it didn't it didn't go the way I wished it had gone. Right. And those are the ones I think about every day. And those so filmmakers funny. are people who it's don't work. It's so human. I just yeah. want to say that is such a human thing. Yeah. Don't we all do that? I, yeah. I'll work on a movie, screening the movie, and I'll have five screenings in a row that just go flawlessly. And then one where my respondents in the focus group are just lousy mm-hmm. or I'm off. I'm just having an off day yep. or something. And it just doesn't gel. Yep. It happens. And you obsess about that. I totally do. I, I mean, my last movie that I would say that just didn't go well. I think about all the things I could have done differently, and I'd wish I had done differently. And you can't go back. I mean, the movie's done. It's been delivered. It's been screened. Everyone saw it. It's already out. But I go back, and I go, I could have done that better. I could have mm. handled that situation better. I mean, oftentimes in post, we're in the pressure cooker. We come through the screening process. We come through the pushes and extensions and VFX delays and music delays and all these delays. And we still have a, a ticking clock where we have to deliver the movie, and it gets really intense. And sometimes you just... Don't make the best decisions or handle it the best way. You know, you bring up the post-production producer. We didn't really get to the supervisor part. Is it essentially the same thing? It is the same thing. And to discern on what credit I take on whatever movie it is, I mean, I pretty Before much Before or after? Well, I'm mean, usually hired, right? I'm mean, just hired as Nancy Kerhofer. Can you do the post-production? I'm the, I'm the post-production gal, right? <laughs> and then it's never really stipulated, like, what my credit's going to be. Now, there are some companies or some people who will never give me a post-producer. It's a thing. You're a post-supervisor, and it's a, it's kind of like the cast system. Like, you are just not going to get beyond that. So I'm like, fine. No harm, no foul. Like, I'm not fighting. You know, but there are movies where— You really are I was contributing produ- in a I was different way. I was the producer. Like, there was nobody there on the ground, boots on the ground, and there were very difficult conversations. Are you decisions. getting different money for that, by the way? I hate no, to ask, it's but... never about money. Ever about money. In other words, they're paying your fee, period. They pay my fee. So what? if you're doing more work, that's just Doesn't on it? you. It's just, it's wow. Just, that's kind of the rub to post supervisors, producers. Like, we are the line producers, right? Like, the very, very worst line producer working today makes more money than the best of us as supervisors oh. in post, right? I mean, it's kind of— How did of, you come up in this business? I always wanted to work in the movie business, always. I loved it. I grew up in Connecticut where oftentimes we were snowed in and, you know, we'd be— like, I lived in rural, rural Connecticut where all I did all day was watch TV and watch movies, and I just obsessed about it. And so I graduated from high school and just came straight here. My mother, poor sweet mother, had, like, a heart attack. Like, came right to Hollywood. Came right— well, circumnavigated. <laughs> it came to San Diego, said I'd live with an uncle, and then got to got to L.A. Right, so within, you, like, so eight you, months. So but you I was arrived 18. here. What's your first job? Well, then I was working as a frozen yogurt place, right? I mean, I really didn't break in like I wanted to. But my very first real job, like I got on yeah. set, was working for a film director as her assistant. And I loved it. As her assistant. Yeah. That and, must have been interesting because yeah. when you came up, there were not very few female directors. Well, I didn't have the money to go to school, to film school. So I used to crash film classes. I used to, like, go to places. I'd volunteer. And then I would crash the classes. And, and I had this really tracked this this film director. I'm going to drop her name because, hey, I can. It's Mary Lambert. She was – I idolized oh, Mary, Mary Lambert. Mary Lambert. I just spoke Love to her. her. I Love did Pet her. Cemetery with her. Well, I love Pet Cemetery. I've seen it like 17,000 times. But I also love the movie Siesta that she did. Yeah. I loved it. I loved it. I actually was so poor. And this is really going to – be not good for my character, but I was so poor, but I wanted to own the movie. It was a VHS cassette dating myself, right? It was $99 to buy this movie, right? $99. Oh I didn't Lord. make $99 a week at the time, right? <laughs> so I went to like some video hut place, whatever it was, now long out of business, so I can't make restitution. I her, worked but... at a video hut, by the way, in really? New York City. Okay, this was in LA, so I didn't steal from you. But what I did was <laughs> I went to the, the back bin this is the old days before scanning. It was all, all stickers, right? This is like long time Oh, ago. I get it. We used to re-shrink wrap yeah. the oh, yeah. boxes. So this people with would a blow think, dryer, right? So with a blow new. dryer. Yeah. So people would think they're getting a new copy. <laughs> well, I went to the back to like, you know, whatever like the worst movies were that were $9.99. And I switched the tags. And I went to – so I put the took off the $99 tag with the $9.99 tag. Oh so I bought God. it for 10 bucks, oh. And that was a big purchase for me at the time, right? That's no, a big theft and is what that is. And it's a big theft. I actually <laughs> stole like 90 bucks from a oh, oh, oh. video hub. But that's how much I admired Mary's work. Wow. And I watched Did you ever tell Mary that? 
I may. I want to. I, I actually don't know. Mary, do you know that story? We should get um, her on. We should get we should her really on. Really have this. a duo, do a, a, a podcast together. So that was my, and I watched it, and I studied her. Like I loved so much about that because the music was amazing. Miles Davis, the cast was amazing. Anyway, then weirdly enough, I mean, out of many happenstances, I'm a PA on a thing, and Mary's one of the directors of. This Isn't thing. that insane? And it, and it was serendipitous. Like, oh huh? my god, Mary Lambert. And, and I they, used to like, but they say, they say. Never meet your heroes. They'll disappoint you. Did That was not the case. It was not the case. I met her. So I was the PA on the show, and she had this amazing assistant. So I'm like, I'll never get close to her because her assistant was amazing. And then all of a sudden, I became friends with the assistant, and the assistant basically told me she was leaving because she had another job offer, and she had been with Mary for a while. And what I, was I interested in? The, I mean, this is a true story. Was I interested in taking over her job? I'm like, are you kidding me? Oh, my Lord. And so— What a, what a break. It was— Crazy. And so I ended up being Mary's assistant for a few years, and I learned so much. She, How did you land, though, in post-production? Because well, then, that's, you're so associated with that particular well, part of the filmmaking process. And for those listeners who aren't as aware, there's a pre-production process, yeah. prep it's called. And then there's the production cycle mm-hmm. where you're actually in production and shooting. And then, of course, there's the post-production process. Yep. How long is a post-production process typically? 26 weeks. 26 weeks. Mm -hmm. Six months. Yep. I tend to always say that's the sweet spot. It could be as short as 20 weeks. It could be as long as a year. (laughs) Who do you mostly interact with in your area? Well, the picture editor, I am mostly directly involved with the film editor, for sure. That's my number one ally, always. Picture editor. Picture editor. Okay. Um, The director. Work very close with the director. And then hopefully a producer is involved in somewhat. So those are the three key relationships I have in post. And then, of course, the post crew, which is the sound crew, the music crew. the VFX Do you organize crew. the score? Would you go to score sessions? Do I you would, go to mixing sessions? I do. I go to as many as I can. Yeah. I don't organize a score session. Usually the music supervisor does that. But I go. Do you to, go to color, color timing sessions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So all, really you're involved in mm-hmm. all of those yeah. things and have to make sure all of them go And they're smoothly. amazing. To and how many witness. folks do you have working for you? I have a coordinator and an assistant. Any names? Not dropping names. Okay. <laughs> David and Jordan. Um, yeah, but no, I have a you know, well, staff. Well, I know David for years. Yeah, and David's he's fantastic. the best. He's Just the best. fantastic. Yep. It's interesting to hear about who you interact with. Can you share with our listeners who really was a joy, other than Mary, who was a joy to work with? I'm kind of going to go to the other side, which you may answer, you may not. But who really sort of respected, got, understood the process in a really uh, incredible way and made you feel really part of the process? Interesting. Good question. I mean, most of them do. I mean, I really have not had a bad experience. Most of them do. Uh, Most of them do. I I will say, you know, one of my all-time favorite human beings next to you, of course, walking the face of the earth, is Aaron Sorkin. He is the first filmmaker, director, who ever gave me a shout-out at the premiere. First time ever. Really? Yep. Of 150 movies? Yep. Hey, look, my job is I get things done, right? That's like the big thing. I get shit done. I get shit done. I am not noticed unless I'm doing something bad. If I just do my job and do it really, really well, I make everyone else look great. I mean, everyone shines. So I don't really call attention to myself. Not many people go, oh, my God, that was the best post-supervised movie ever. There's no such award. So a lot of times directors and producers don't know what I'm doing just because they'll think the editor did it or this soap person did it or whatever because I just make things move and keep it going and keep it going, right? And it was Aaron who all the – I mean, the first time I'm sitting in the audience, you know, the premiere, I'm eating my big bucket of popcorn, and he's making an introduction. And then all of a sudden he says my name. I'm like, oh, my God. And people are clapping, and I've never, ever in my history of my career. That's great. It was incredibly moving, and he totally got what it was, how I brought – the project too. And it was a Herculean effort to get everything done on what we had to do. Well, when I see you or colleagues of yours like Lisa Rogers or Lisa Dennis yeah. or Paul Levin, great. so many of the, the great post folks in our business, I'm always amazed at just all the details yeah. that you're dealing with. I see the mind going. You must be very nervous the night of a test screening. Mm-hmm. I kind of want to talk about yeah. getting to the moment of yeah. the test preview and how that works in the schedule, and how important it is. Yeah. I start early on with – I work a lot with first-time directors. That's my my thing. And I start early on prepping them for the preview. Now, why do you do mostly independent films? What's the reason for that? I love them. I love Ah, them. Oh, there you go. And I'm not a – 
good studio person. Like I don't, I don't do well marching to orders. Like, Would you kind of scrappier? I'm a little scrappier, and I mean, studios are great, and thank God for them because they're amazing, and I love everyone who works at them. But I don't like being in an office. I I love the fact that I spend more time in my car, moving to different places, and sitting in an office. I. Does a studio pay more than an independent? And I only ask that because it can't be more or less work. I mean, it's probably the same yeah, work, right? It's the same. I don't, I, I've never really asked. If the, I know. That's an interesting really, question, isn't it? Because I'm thinking to myself, huh, like, uh, do you know, we never have any money. Yeah. I'm sure that's part of your criteria, by the way, to accept a job or not. If they don't have money to finish yeah. your, right? Yeah, for sure. That has to be yeah. a, a part of the equation. Yeah. But I think I like independent films because I get to work with such a variance of people. Like, like I don't just do one kind of movie. I don't work for one type of person. So right, right. I get to like really just go through the whole spectrum of different you know movies I get to work on and things that interest me. So I think I'm pretty lucky. So now the screening, you often have to persuade mm-hmm. and let your particularly first time filmmakers yep. know just what this process means. And I'd like to hear yeah. it from you. Because they're what, how... scared of it. It's a very scary thing. Why? Because you're a first-time filmmaker. You have spent all this time in prep. You spent all this time in production, which is super exciting, right? You have all these people doing amazing things. And it's like a big love fest. And you're creating this stuff. And you're like super exhausted in the best kind of way coming out of production. And then you go into post and something you don't really know about. And it all of a sudden, it goes from being very big to being very intimate in the cutting room. And I believe that the director's cut is hallowed ground. It is a time for a director to just really marinate in their movie, to relax, to see it all from a different perspective because they've never really seen it. They've just seen dailies and they haven't seen it cut together and they see the editor's assembly and oftentimes they're like, oh my gosh, it's not what I thought it was. So by the time they get through their 10-week director's cut, they're now releasing it to the world. As I remember Toby Emmerich said to me, it's it's when the rubber hits the road. Truly. And things that you may love as a filmmaker because you were on the set the day you created it and it was beautiful and funny and wonderful. And you put it in your cut and you're not really quite sure if it's working, but you really hope it is. But an audience is going to tell you because they don't love you like you love your work. They're going to tell you the truth and you don't know. And like there's – and a lot of time first-time filmmakers are super afraid of – Losing that control because they've had so much control to this point. It's the first time that actually they're now at the mercy of somebody else. So for me, I begin really early on talking about what a gift it is. Like this is the really, the really important part It's your part time of the to learn. Yeah. Your laboratory, if yeah, you will, right? totally. Especially in independent films because – Often you don't have the studio execs coming to a first preview. Nope. And many studio execs ha- are very respectful and have gotten more so by allowing the filmmaker to have that first preview with yep. no one attending. Yep. And I think it's really important. I think it is too. You know, because you have to kind of fall on your face sometimes to make it even better than it started out. I know? actually oftentimes as we get into like the second pass of a director's cut, which is like week six or so. Wait a minute. Second pass of the director. Week so, six. So, right. so the t- yeah, explain this to people. The DGA director's cut is 10 weeks. So the clock starts after the editors assembled all the footage into a complete linear cut of the script. But usually it is the director has a hand in that first assembly, no? I mean, no? certainly the director will have seen cut scenes and stuff, but usually the editor will assemble the picture. And this is what we have. Yeah. And this is where we start from. And oftentimes it, the scenes run long because they want to, the director to come in and just see how it all lays out. And then, so the first pass is really going through every, making sure you have all the takes and that kind of thing. So the pass is usually like three hours long. And so that usually the first pass is two, three weeks and the second pass is within the 10 week period. Within the 10 week yeah. period. So they have like the first two or three weeks of, their, of the director's cuts, the first pass and they do a second pass. And so by the time like they're getting towards the end of the director's cut, you're hoping they've gone through the movie a couple times. Not always the case, by the way, but you're hoping that they've had time to like go through it. And most movies, you want the sweet spots between 100 minutes and two hours, depending on the movie, of course. So I always say to the, the filmmakers, put it in a theater. I don't care if it's just you And the editor need to get out of the cutting room, stop looking on the TV, and sit in a theater. Whether you invite some people, whether you have a quote-unquote friends or family, whatever it is, you need to get out of the intimacy of your cutting room and see it projected on the screen so it feels like a movie to you. I have some major filmmakers who screen their movies six weeks after they finish shooting. Yeah, and many, many do. I, yeah. Exactly. So that they're just waiving that right, in yeah. other words, right? Well, yeah. The DJ gives 10 weeks. 
If they can do it in faster than 10 weeks, that's up to them. They can they can do whatever they want. But, but it doesn't mean they're out of their cut. No, nope, They're still in their still, 10 weeks. But yep. a lot of them, just like to your point, Nan, yep. a lot of these people like to use the time yeah. with the audience feedback to create their cut. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so then after the 10-week cut. Then you go to the official preview process. And mm-hmm. usually that's a period of like four to six weeks, depending on how many previews you can afford, how many previews a studio wants to do. And then post-production is really based on a backwards scenario, working back from a mm-hmm. delivery date, correct? correct? Exactly right. And who sets that delivery The date? distributor. What if there's no distributor? Do you set it? Then it's really based on how much money you have, Got right? Because there's a weekly, to keep the editing there's a weekly operating cost. So, sure. Yeah, so sure. you need to like how much money do you have for post, how much money do you have for editing? Yeah. What's one of the biggest surprises you've ever seen at a preview you probably because with 150 titles you're probably looking at a minimum of 500 previews that you've attended totally well you i'm pretty good at guessing i've done so many now i can usually be pretty close to what i think it's going to be i think the biggest surprise to me was i worked on a sequel to a very successful movie called and, nope not dropping names oh. um Oh, I can, right? I mean, yeah, right. if it's been released. So I did the sequel to um, Neighbors. Na- did Neighbors 2. Oh, we did that together. Yeah, we did. Yeah. And so Neighbors 1 was amazing, right? It was super funny and like did super successful and everyone was, it was great. So they did one and they decided to flip it and be like a sorority, like be with girls, right? So basically it's taken the same premise of like, you know, fraternity boys being naughty and let's have the girls do it. And we thought it was hilarious. Like, I'd seen it a couple of times. But what we learned in the preview process is that stuff that boys got away with, <laughs> the girls didn't really – the humor wasn't there, mm-hmm. right? I mean, the movie was still funny. And when we finished it, it was hilarious. But like, There were moments and parts, right? You the, had to sort of And the number was super low. But how did it end? Way up there. Okay, so you, what you learned is, uh-oh, we better – we better have a different kind of guardrail here. Yeah, well, they realize it's for like the what, jokes and what, so forth. But plays yeah. right. Not all audiences are the same. Not all movies are the same. Not all characters are the same. Did like, you do any reshoots? Yeah, the guys were. I think these guys are brilliant. I mean, these guys are super funny. They're brilliant, and so they're just like, and they all laughed. Like, oh yeah, okay. And so they wrote some new scenes. They tweaked the characters, and it was hilarious in the end. And we also previewed like six times. And it was successful. Super successful. But I you think. know, comedies, I got to tell you, comedies, Sasha Baron Cohen, mm-hmm. Judd Apatow, so many of the great comedy directors really embrace the process yeah. Yeah. of screening their movies because often they don't even care about the numbers as much as just listening to the audience yeah. and seeing how yeah, things, how, how their jokes feels. are landing and trying new jokes. That's exactly right. And, I and that's you saying what Neighbors 2 did and yeah. ultimately yeah. went from a what was an average result to yep. a really great yep. result. Yep. That's so great because, yep. by the way, your filmmakers listened. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, another really great story is I did Book Smart with Olivia Wilde, who's the real deal. She's amazing. And I specifically told her when we go to the preview, she was nervous of the preview, of course, right? And I said, Was that her first, first preview? Movie. Oh. Yeah, first preview, first movie. And I said, Whatever you do, because they, they snuck her in the back because they obviously, as they do with any sort of celebrity, they want to make sure that the audience doesn't see you come in. And so, but Olivia was unique in the fact that she's a celebrity, but she was the filmmaker, the director. And I said to her, I'm um, tape off a seat in the middle of the theater. And and she's not understanding exactly why I'm saying it. I said, because you want to make sure you're, you're feeling the Absolutely, audience. Absolutely, and, and really immersed. So the movie starts, and we're at this really wonky theater, if you remember, out in Woodland Hills. That yeah, had the, that AMC. Yeah, it had the weird acoustics, right? Actually, anyway, it's my favorite comedy house. It's a great comedy it's house. It's number gone. one comedy house, but it's, it's, gone. it's gone. But but it had that weird acoustics. Very where, weird, weird, right? But but beautiful for a comedy yeah. because it really almost it, sounded like there were double the number of people the in the house. one thing you cannot do is sit in the back because the back is very boomy. You can't hear anything. Sure. And also there was a slight overhead. Right. So yeah. you really – and you it's a dead zone, right? But I just want people to listen to the, what, how we talk about theaters and sound. All and matters. This is, no, it all matters. Keep going. So I say to Liv, just – when you come in, there's a seat. So, of course, the movie starts and it's all a little hectic because she doesn't want to miss it. So she comes running in and she takes the first seat that's available in the back row. Oh. And I can't do anything at this point because I'm like <laughs> looking at her and and I'm like, oh, man, alive, right? Anyways, the movie plays. plays amazing, right? The audience loved it. Loved it played it. great. You did it. It was hilarious. So movie ends. She goes out in the back. And she's livid. Because it sounded terrible. It was a terrible screen. I mean, literally, she's really upset. And I'm like, I'm like, Olivia, it played great. No, it didn't. I'm like, 
honestly, I'm telling you, it's where you sat. Anyway, make a long story short, she comes in for the focus group. And this is the time before the, we had the handheld devices where we don't have the number. Was we had to wait for the number while we're doing the focus group. And she's really anxious, as, as we all were. And, of course, the numbers come back. It scored really, really well. People loved it. And, and it was that kind of moment of like, aha, I get it. But, you know, I have to tell you something. I purposely, when I produce a movie or have produced a dozen movies, the, I will purposely ask for to listen on the shit boxes, they call them, mm-hmm. you know, or the junk boxes, or it, it, which are mono, mm-hmm. because I want the worst yeah. way to hear an experience. And so if I think it was actually a happy accident in a way, because then when she saw the next time and probably yeah. sat in a really good place, totally. she suddenly, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Right. The most important thing is to feel and hear your audience. Like most, Do you videotape the audience typically? Sometimes, sometimes infrared. Not. The infrared yeah, depends. Uh, some people do. Some people it depends on the studio. Technology, they, right? I mean, more often now we're doing it on all comedies. We're doing it. Absolutely, um, it's super helpful. It's super. Tell us why. That's that's because well, I agree with you completely. Well, a lot of times the stadium seating, you're missing some of the humor, like people laughing because it's all getting absorbed in the seats and the way the rake is. So at least if you have if you're recording it, what we try to do is we get the recording, we sync it up in the avid, so you're seeing the audience play while you're editing, so you can see what jokes they were laughing at. Because you could maybe didn't hear it or feel it, but then you can see it. And you also can see when they start shifting in their seats. Well, you got it. Here's what I like to do and recommend. Play the movie on fast forward and look at the cadence of the comedy yeah. and where there are slow parts. Yeah. And you sync it up yeah. to where it is in the movie. And you could actually – it's so fascinating, yeah. Yeah. Nancy, when you're doing – because you know that often if a movie, a comedy particularly, is too long, if you truncate it, suddenly – making it a little shorter, you will mm. somehow get the jokes closer together and mm. the movie becomes funnier. Yeah. Often, not all the time, yeah. but, but often. Or sometimes that. they're too truncated and you're missing the jokes. Well, that's what that we learn steps that too. on it. Yeah, steps yeah. on it as well. But I'm saying in terms of looking at the video yeah. footage in fast forward gives you that saying, wow, they are, they're restless here. Yeah. You know, we got to fill that. Yeah. We got to fill that with a joke or we've got to edit it mm-hmm. tighter. Mm-hmm. So I think that's really, really sort of fascinating. Yeah. We're going to pause our conversation here just for a moment. We'll be right back. Get a glimpse into a secret part of Hollywood that few are aware of and that filmmakers rarely talk about. In the new book, Audienceology by Kevin Getz. Each chapter is filled with never before revealed inside stories and interviews from famous studio chiefs, directors, producers, and movie stars, bringing the art and science of Audienceology into focus. Audienceology, how moviegoers shape the films we love. From Tiller Press at Simon & Schuster, available now. We are back. So the the screening process, I know you've been so kind to Screen Engine ASI. You've used us since I founded the company and very grateful for that. We try to please you because you have a certain expectation of excellence. What does it mean for you to to work with us? And what is it that you demand? And why do you demand that level of excellence? Well, all your moderators are at a certain level, right? I've had to use other companies. I mean, we do. It's a a business. And and sometimes I don't have control over that. Next thing I know, we're doing it with so-and-so. It's so-and-so. And and I'm like, oh, this is not going to go well. But the one thing that I truly love about your company and Screen Engine is that your moderators are spot on. And there's already a love for filmmaking, right? They already like you and Terry and Aaron. You you already love movies. You've already seen like you've seen everything. And there's a general enthusiasm that there's you have. There's a genuine love of movies. That's a, a very good point. And and, yeah. and that's what you need because when you're selling to this to these focus groups, is how like I'm not part of the movie, mm-hmm. which you really are kind of, but you're but you're not. And so you're like you're you saw it for the first time when they saw it for the first time. It's very rare you see it beforehand. Very rare. Sometimes we show it to you beforehand, but very rare. So you're enjoying it for the first time with them. And then you have a this genuine conversation about the movie that feels real. And well, I, you just said two words that really struck me, genuine and real, because yeah. if you aren't authentic with the audience, they're not going to give you authentic mm-hmm. responses, are they? I've seen it happen. I know you have. And so I was going to ask you, can you give me an example where you heard a comment in a group that really was going to take the thing south? Or perhaps it might have been saved by the moderator, but you know that 
it really could be damaging or that you cringed because you knew it was a sore spot for your director or something like that? I have been in previews, not with you, but I have been in previews where the moderator is leading the group down a path that is serving an agenda for a marketing purpose. That may not be what's best for the movie in general or what the director needed to hear or – but sometimes that happens, right? And those are the times that you feel it, right? And Conscious of that there is a focus group, you the, mean period? Yeah, there's yeah. a group and that you're – they're being led down a path. Like you – and and sometimes you have to ask the tough questions and sometimes you are handed a question that the filmmakers need to know. But it's – there are times but where – But you I, have to find a way, as you're saying – to bake it in so that it doesn't feel like you're leading them. That you're, it's because real. obviously it's there are marketing questions that you yeah. have to bring mm-hmm. up, and it could be a somewhat inelegant way to yeah. get there. But you have to figure out a way to get there organically and elegantly, I, yeah. I suppose. Well, look, for instance, like a bad question would be, did you like the ending? You know, that's a bad question. That's a focus group faux pas. Right? You don't ever ask You that. don't ever ask that question. But you ask a question more like, what, what are did your you th- thoughts of the ending? Exactly. What, what, did you, what did you respond to or what, what did you when like? When I say ending, yeah. what comes to mind? Exactly. As opposed to leading them down because like, no, I didn't, right? <laughs> Often when uh, speaking about ending, I'll ask the question, when I say ending, what comes to mind? Mm-hmm. Because I say, let me expand on that. What is the actual scene or part mm-hmm. that you imagine as being the ending? Because you could have an entire discussion yeah. where someone is thinking they're talking about the coda ending. Yep. And someone is talking about the ending from when they rescued them from the police mm-hmm. station. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you know whatever? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like that. And so you want to know what they're talking about first to make sure we're all on the same page. Right. What I'll often do is take an ending. The ending, as we know, is so important mm-hmm. to the overall scores of a movie because it's what the people are left with. Yep. I'll often take it scene by scene and kind of get consensus as to is that part working, not working, working okay, working really mm-hmm. well, not working so well. Yep. And you can actually build a case to see that the second and the fourth part of that sequence of the end are less than effective. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really helpful for a filmmaker. That is super helpful. And that is the helpful question. That is the helpful way to get to that answer. Yeah, for sure. What is your favorite question in a focus group? What is the thing that you find the most helpful question? I think one of the most important questions you ask, whether I think it's helpful or not, will you recommend this to your friends? Mm -hmm. What would you say? Mm -hmm. Right. That is the most important thing that you're going to glean from the whole experience. Will you recommend it? And what would you say? And you know what mine is? Um, That's usually at a marketing screening more geared for a final screening. Mm -hmm. That question for me, uh, because I think it is a great question to me. The my favorite question is if you didn't rate the movie. Uh, Yeah. Excellent. You gave it a very good, which Mm -hmm. is still a good rating. Yeah, Yeah. Or you gave it a good and you didn't give it even a very good. Why not? What's holding you back? What's holding you back? Yeah. And sometimes the gold that comes out of that. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. And you know, by nature of the the way we structure a focus group, Mm -hmm. we usually talk about the scenes and parts and characters they like best. We usually start with that. I love filmmakers that say, I love the first five minutes of a focus (laughs) group. They're always designed to get, you know, by design, the more positive responses. But then I ask the question, so we're not leading them in, if there's any holdback, what's the holdback? But then there's three areas that we ask, almost always, because there are three elements that have real impact. They are confusions, pace, and the ending. Yeah. And we really need to probe on those things. Yeah. And sometimes you get some really good stuff, and sometimes it's a less, I don't know, less obvious answer. Yeah. I would say, by and large... After a preview, one of the biggest things that are attacked is, is the ending. It's, it's the, the number one area of the movie. Because they'll forgive a mm-hmm. lot before. Totally. Right? If you have a really good ending. Yep. But if you're not satisfied, if you as an audience are not satisfied by the end of the movie, then boom. So funny you say that because satisfaction is really the key. Mm-hmm. But it's not just the word, the general satisfaction. It's two sides of the same coin. There are two things necessary in terms of satisfaction that need to be adhered to. The first is intellectual satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Are all my questions answered? Did the logic make sense? Or am I left to go, what the F was that? But also emotional satisfaction. What did I feel? Mm -hmm. And as we know, with theatrical movie going in particular, 
that satisfaction level and that emotional connection will boost your definite recommend. Yep. To not have both of those, I find, is very rare to get a high score. Mm-hmm. You kind of need both. Would you agree with that? I totally agree with that. Absolutely. People want to, A, they want to be surprised by a movie. They go into a movie and they don't really know exactly what they're getting into. So they want to go on a ride. They want to go on a journey. They want to be moved. They want to be transported for the X amount of time they're in the theater. And they want to leave, like, feeling good. You know, we talked about Mary Lambert before with reverence. As a woman in this industry, have you found it hard to navigate or have you never seen it as an impediment? I have to say, for me personally, it's been my superpower. Oh, I love it. Explain, please. So I came into post-production many years ago, and there were only a few of us females doing it. And th- those of us who were female doing it, I didn't know the Lisa's at the time. They're working at the studio as a post-production person. So it wasn't many of us independent people. And so I used to love to go to the labs and to the back room of the stage and everything. Because at the time, mostly men working in the industry. And they loved the fact that I wanted to learn. They loved the fact that I asked the questions and I wanted to know, like, I wanted to know what mag was. I wanted to know what an M&E was. I mean, all these things that go. What like, a mag is? What's a mag? 35 millimeter mag. It's a it's a film element. Like, it's the unglamorous part of the business, which and what's, no longer. And what was the other thing you said? What or was a... what was, like, negative cutting or what was, you know. Uh, I remember like, what, negative cutting. A, 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 you know, hazel team Married timing print. and all those things, right? Like, it was oh, men in ties running the labs, right? And I'd come in and I would like – I sat through every answer print screening. I was very good friends with the timers. I learned everything from these guys. There's no more answer prints. No, not at all. And, um, and they're not cutting negative. And not cutting negative Let's anymore. Let's just say it for Although the <laughs> – Dee Bassett was a female. Uh, Mo Henry, they were the preeminent negative cutters. But they were my friends. And um, But they but mostly it was men. But you asked questions. I asked questions and I wanted to learn. Do you think you had the same opportunities? I think so. I'm going to say I think I came in at the exact moment where it was – the industry was changing. There was more opportunity. There was a lot more work. I never not worked. If okay. there was a young person coming up in the industry now, would you recommend what you do as a career? Yeah, I actually, I'm, I'm actually training people now. Like you know, like people. It's don't, like our business. It's our yeah. job to do that, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. I think it's really important. And but what would you tell a young person who maybe didn't know as much about your field, which is very particular, but very much the offshoot of what an overall producer does right. in the post area, primarily in the mm-hmm. post area, what would you tell them and what advice would you give them? Well, you know what I, I say to everybody who comes as a PA or interviews to be working on our team? You come into post-production, you're going to learn from the back end, right? Like I, I produce movies. I was very fortunate that I had done a bunch of post movies for Neil Moritz, and Neil gave me my first producing gig. I actually produced two movies, was a producer on two of his movies, small movies, very, very small, not his big movies. But he also said, hey, you're smart, and you want to do this? I'm like, sure. But I knew how to do it because I saw what ended up on the cutting room floor. I saw the back end. I knew what things, how everything ended. Like, you look at a cost report, you know everything, what everything cost. And so you will learn the end result so when you go to the front end, you understand the process. You understand what's important, what's important to capture, what's important to wh- – wh- when you're in production, what's important to the finishing of your movie, to the delivery of your movie, to selling of your movie, which is ultimately what everyone wants to do is they want the movie to be in a theater for people to enjoy. And that all happens in post-production. So it's, it's a tremendous learning ground. And as a PA in post – you aren't regulated to one thing like you are in production. Either you're like much more department oriented. What, what are the primary skill sets? Well, primary. Primary is you are organized, that you are a go getter, that you are proactive, that you make shit happen. Make shit happen. Like and pivot at any moment. Things will go south in post production. You just need to keep moving forward. I always said we just keep moving forward, moving forward. What are some of the pitfalls that you look out for in your profession? What are some of the major pitfalls that in lesser hands, uh uh-oh. It is understanding your budget and your time. You Mm. have to literally, it's a big picture thing, right? I'm a big picture person. Like you have to look at the big picture of how much money do you have and how much time does that allow you? Because in production, there's a finite amount of money as well. 
But oftentimes they're going into a contingency. They're doing other things. But like in post, we don't have the luxury. Candidly, there have been times when you and I have had conversations. This is talking a little bit out of school, but not badly, where you've said we're doing a preview because they were trying something. And you would come to me kind of off camera and you'd say, I have to lock this movie by Tuesday. Like, I don't know what we can really do. But I'll tell you something. That's good information Mm -hmm. for me to have because you know that you can't go in and recommend a reshoot. You may be able to do that final thing in the end Mm -hmm. and lock the rest of the picture and then keep that. Am I right about that? We have to work sort of in tandem to understand because I'm trying to give you and the filmmakers the best information possible. Yep. So if I'm giving you something that is only going to make people frustrated and it's not helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is a tricky thing. Like, you know, we come into a preview and, you know, we're at week 12 of a 20-week schedule. And we're – oh, wait. So 12 and a 20-week schedule. What is that? That's – you're already nervous? You're already nervous because you're like – because now you're getting feedback and you're hoping that the picture is 90% in the pocket – and that this preview is going to garner enough information that we can lock in two weeks. That's the the main thing. Like you're hoping that the preview is going to go well, that we're pretty close to it, and the information that we get is just going to put the final touches on it and we're good to go. Bad news is if you like your week 15 of a 25-week schedule or 20-week schedule, whatever, and you get a 62, like you know you're in big trouble. Like that's the worst case scenario because a 62 means it's good. <laughs> You know, like, see, I just want to say, look how great. you get this intrinsically. A 62 is essentially an average score. Yeah. And what yeah. grade is an average? Yeah. Yeah. It's a C. It's a C. And, and I tell us the filmmakers. It's a solid C. If you and at, who wants to be a C? Nobody. And who can be a C? And, you know, in this world, it's almost like, remember, there were there were comments like content. I'm sorry. Content is king. Yeah. You know, um, the, the distribution is king. Uh, marketing is king. Now it's back to content is not just not just content is king, but great good content. content. Not good. Yeah, good great. is C, maybe great. B. Great content. Well, it is depends king. on what you want to do. That's the new trick yeah. here, right? But even on any platform, as you know, because you've worked now mm-hmm. with the streamers, no consumer, no customer, no moviegoer, no movie viewer wants to see subpar content. They want to all see great content, regardless yep. of the platform. Yep. Am I correct? Well, because they can they can switch on something else. You got it. And I mean, something like, great. Like, because there is so much yep. really good stuff out there. Yep. So the bar has risen yep. to a place where we have to aspire higher in order to fulfill on mm-hmm. that claim. Yeah. There have been plenty of movies. I mean, I have worked on movies before that got in the 60s and 70s and like, oh, it's above, slightly above the norm. It's going to be okay because it's a niche movie. It'll do fine. That is no longer the case, right? Like, because it basically means 40% of your audience is like, eh, let's go watch the Queen's Gambit one more time. You know what I mean? Ah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, yes. Like, I mean, the that's... ecosystem of a movie viewer or mm-hmm. a television viewer is so different than ours. Like, mm-hmm. they don't think like, oh, that's coming out then. Mm-hmm. They don't even feel bad. Like, they're not punishing you for that. They're just saying, well, if you don't have that, say, day and date for me, I'm just going to see something else. When movies that are, like, going streaming and theatrical, but they're opening day and date, right? With Like, Apple's doing it sometimes. You know, I think there's a two-week window for Netflix now. Mm-hmm. Your first act is king. A lot of times you can have a slow burn. Like, people are sitting in the audience. They've already bought their ticket. They have a two-hour window. Like, you can spend your time setting up and if the ending is really great, you're, you have a success. Now you got to hit it all. Like, you got to hit all the beats. That's right. Because if your opening isn't good, if your first 10 minutes isn't good. If and you're, you're about, streaming a movie, you're out. I'm, like, making doing laundry. And I've, like, oh. going back to Queen's Gambit. And by the way, know? the same thing is true of trailers. Yeah. yeah. The whole notion of a slow burn yeah. it doesn't work anymore. Nope. And people don't even remember where they necessarily saw a trailer. So do they see it in a theater? Do they see it online? If you have an online trailer, that's the one you defer to because mm-hmm. the, that is the one that has to grab you right out of the gate and hold you mm-hmm. and then end yep. in a high note. It's a lot. Yeah. You're right. It's the same with the actual content itself yeah. with yeah. the IP. Remember, it used to be like, oh, well, that movie is relegated to home video. Yeah. Not so Not anymore. anymore. 
Now it's just like nobody wants to see subpar content. Which is kind of exciting, though, it's right? very exciting. Because it, it means that better material is being produced. Well, Better filmmakers absolutely. are working. I mean, at first it was a bit scary. And now it's I embrace it because everyone's got their game up, right? It's almost like I don't even want to use norms anymore. Yeah. I want to use targets. There are some well, studios that simply use targets mm -hmm. because it's forget norms. That's yeah. what are they? Yeah. But it just gives you a basic sense of this is how most movies do here kind of sort of. But if you aspire to do bigger and better and more satisfying and mm -hmm. broadening your audience, that's I think yeah. the name of the game and we love doing it. Before we break here, do you have anyone that you really admire right now who's out there that is just, I uh, really would love to work with them. Well, I'm going to name drop now because Ava DuVernay, and I'm actually <gasps> doing her new movie. I've been watching her stuff, and I am such a huge fan of wow. her and what she does in the industry. And in what and a talented lady, she's amazing. And, and but not just in movies; it's like everything she does. Right? I just got hired to do her movie that she's shooting right now, and it is a dream. Congratulations! Yeah, it's pretty cool. She's an amazing filmmaker and just a person. And Alan Baumgarten is the editor, who is one of my favorite people as well. You're pretty amazing yourself. And I want to thank you so much for sitting with me today. It's kind of odd because we know each other so well. And, and I just feel like this is a really good opportunity for the listeners to get another perspective, another point of view of an area of the business that really can make or break a movie. And thank you, Nan. Thank well, you so thank much. Thank you for having me. What a treat to be here. And to our listeners, I hope you enjoyed today's interview. Check out Nancy's recent work, two of many of her projects, and both Kenya Barris projects, You People, which Kenya directed, and the remake of White Men Can't Jump. For other stories like this one, please check out my book, Audienceology, at Amazon or wherever books are sold or through my website at kevingets360.com. You can also follow me on my social media at kevingets360. Next time on Don't Kill the Messenger, I'll welcome producer and former president of MGM, John Glickman. And until next time, I'm Kevin Getz. And to you, our listeners, I appreciate you being part of the movie-making process. Your opinions matter.